Okay, we are recording. Um, so, so since we're recording, I'll just say the first part again. Um, welcome to the Humanities Center at Great Basin College Book Club. And we're discussing Indian Horse, a novel by Richard Wagamase. Um, and the discussion is facilitated by GBC's um, Laura Diebenham. So we're just gonna um, go around and those of us that feel comfortable, we'll just kind of introduce ourselves and, and say if, if, we, if we have a connection to the native culture. Um, is that what you think you, um, the question you wanna do, Laura? And sure, and maybe what 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 one interesting thing about the book was. Okay, so I'll just um, I'll go ahead and um, just go from my screen, and I'll start with Gina. You're on the top there, so if you want to unmute yourself, make sure you're unmuted. If you're gonna, hi. Um, I think one interesting thing I thought about the book was. I don't know how fast paced it was. It seemed like everything, by the time you got used to one situation the characters were going through, they were right into a different one. Yeah, I agree. I felt like that made it um, some of the really hard content a little bit more tolerable or, or, or able, not tolerable exactly, but um, able to, you put the book aside after reading a chapter and kind of take a break and, um, and go back. Yeah, I, I watched a, um, an interview with Richard. It is, is the correct, correct pronunciation of his name Waga Mesa? Waga, Waga Macy? Anyway. I'm not exactly sure, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, I watched a, an interview with him and he said that um, basically this, you know, this is a novel, but it's based on several true events. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Gia, I think a lot of the reason it felt so fast paced is because he had, he was, his main character was a conglomerate. Saul was a conglomerate of a whole lot of Native American kids that went through this experience. And so, um you know, but isn't that what life is like? <laughs> I feel like I feel like I turn around and there's a whole new, you know, adventure. But I actually really appreciated that for people like me who have some, you know, unmedicated ADHD. It kept me, I don't know, it kept me on the edge of my seat and wanting to know what would happen next. And I, I kind of enjoyed that fast pace side of it. Great. Um, so we'll go over to um, Kirsten. You, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi. Hi um, I don't have a lot of like history with Native Americans, but um, the town that I've been living in the last few years is by near a reservation. So a lot more encounters and experiences. So um, definitely has piqued my curiosity and um, wanted to be just more like culturally aware. Uh, and, and so I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, what's hardest to see about his life and experiences is that like um, so many adults in his life were just not uh, treating him well, you know, which just the distrust is uh, creates really difficult, um, uh, makes it difficult to have relationships. Yeah, and one of the things that um, in some of my research, surrounding the you know the reality behind the boarding school is that a lot of the adults that were that were um hired in the boarding school so they're isolated from all of their families as well mm -hmm. you know they're they're isolated they're single people they're living on their own and they are also being you know taught this rhetoric that native american people don't have souls that they're that they're not they're not truly people um one of the one of the mantras was kill the Indian, save the man. And so lives of little Native American children don't matter that much, especially if they are not conforming and assimilating into white culture. And so, you know, so many of the adults in Saul's life didn't seem to care. That was the reason behind it. You know, it was, they, they would only care about, um, the Native American children that seem to assimilate more readily. So someone like Saul, who came from a really solid Native background, where he had been, you know, 
sheltered by his grandmother and, you know, lived off the land, didn't have a lot of connection with white people, is not someone that assimilated as well. Until, of course, hockey came along. <laughs> he related to hockey. It gave him something. So, yeah, th that's, a, that's a good insight, Kirsten. Great. Um, Ashley, it's nice to see you again. Ashley's joining us from Winnemucca. I'm, I'm from Winnemucca and I have grown up in Winnemucca and we have a Winnemucca Indian colony here. And then we, there's the Fort McDermott, which is about 70 miles north of here. And that's a, a reservation as well. And it's, this book was really interesting time-wise because I don't know if anyone's heard about the, the lithium project that is proposed up north of Winnemucca. Um, there's been a lot of Native American resistance to that and the fact that there's alleged sacred massacre grounds and, and burials up in the McDermott Caldera where that lithium deposit is located. And that lithium deposit is said to be going to be able to supply a quarter of the world's lithium for the next 46 years. Um, so there's a, a project and a huge amount of capital going behind making this project reality to support the green movement of our of our culture of our society and then there's the people of McDermott and the Indian colonies that are resisting this worried that it's going to drain the water and pollute the land and all of it basically tear up the sacred land that they have had in their families and and that they consider themselves as the keeper of the land and so last night actually there was the air permit quality air quality permit hearing held in Winnemucca and they had to end the meeting early because mostly Native American but protesters were brought flags and drums and and just were very disruptive of the meeting and wouldn't let it go um, the way that it that it needed to go so there's a lot of resistance to that um, the cultural side of it obviously they don't want their land torn up and it was very interesting from the book that we read last month, Miracle Country, when talking about draining those water resources to feed the bigger Los Angeles area. And it's an interesting big picture concept here where we're going to rip up this land to pull out the lithium to supply the world in its industrial pursuits at the cost of the people that have been living on this land for generations and who already have, you know, generational woundings of Native American people who, you know, have already been oppressed in so many ways throughout hundreds of years. So it's very interesting to see. I mean, the people that are behind the Lithium Project are doing the best that they can to help these people with training as far as equipment operating, you know, getting them work ready so that they have opportunities for jobs in that project. And then there's there's some people that are taking that opportunity and participating in that. And then there's others that are bringing their flags and their drums and, and being solidly against that. So it's very interesting to see that unfold right, right now. And I, I write for the newspaper. So it's, I'm, you know, I try to write about these things in a way where you, you see both perspectives of it. Cause they are, I mean, they're not against each other but they are cause they're fighting for the same land. Wow, insightful. <laughs> And so this book, I mean, to, to, to see the struggles that Saul went through and, and alcohol, especially, I mean, in Native American culture, there's, there's a lot of alcohol and, and just in general in our society, of course, but it seems to hit them harder in a lot of ways on the, on the reservations and just from what I've seen in my community. And so seeing that and, you know, somebody might see someone who's a drunk when he was in his fighting stage, but doesn't see the pain behind it. But then also, I mean, in our society, in our life, we see who we see in front of us, but we don't see all the stories and the feelings behind what we've all gone through. And so it's just a lesson in empathy. And Yeah. And, you know, I mean, coming from, a, from the social work perspective, thinking about my pharmacology course in graduate school, uh, when I hear lithium, I think bipolar illness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I just read, I just read, I know, book, right? <laughs> Kay Redfield, and she talks about her experience yeah. with bipolar and being that, and and being on lithium. So it's, it's yeah, all, it, and yeah. it like it's, it was like the magic in the seventies. Lithium was just the magic cure for bipolar illness, and so the irony is that the natives are fighting over this land when, in reality, I mean, you know. There's so many studies out there that show connection with nature can be. As, as therapeutic or even more so than psychopharmacology. 
you know, than anything that you're going to get in a mineral or, a, you know, and now at the same time, no dissing on the, the importance of recognizing mental illness and that, you know, therapeutic medication is so, so important. But I just think there's a certain irony there when a lot of us that are here today are uh, uh, future social workers or, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but that's interesting. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Ashley, for bringing it into our, you know, very modern day <laughs> reality for sure. Great. The timing is fascinating to me. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Gina. Hi, um, I'm Gina and I am in this social work, well, not officially in, but I'm in the third year of the social work program. I just got accepted to UNR, so I will be transitioning this semester. Congratulations. And, thanks. And I really found that it just all came together for like this book and um, because we're studying it in social work and I'm also taking anthropology. And so it's, I've always had views, you know, about what happened, but I really didn't know the depth of the suffering that they went through. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, you know, I so saw it was good for me to, you know, gain all of those details because, you know, I actually have so much more of an understanding and how the generational problems, you know, a lot of people just state that, you know, this happened years ago and they just need to get over it. And, but, you know, studying it and seeing how it, you know, perpetuates generationally, you know, I really understand that better. And another thing too is I've really struggled with the Catholic part of it because I'm Catholic and, um, you know, my mom went to Catholic school when she was growing up and, you know, she's in her 70s, so this was a lot of years ago, but she, she attested to how they, they treated them if they were, you know, stepped out of line at all, or if you didn't understand something, you know, you'd have to put your knuckles out and they would use a ruler. And I mean, today we would consider that abuse. And, you know, I just, it's sad to me that the church, you know, behaved in that manner, mm. um, where religion you know, didn't come across as a safe place, that it was scary. And those children should, have, you know, in a setting, they should have felt safe. And that was far from how they felt. Uh, so it was very disturbing to me. Right. And the, the fact that the, the father that, you know, helped Saul feel safe ended up mm -hmm taking advantage of him sexually and assaulting him in a worse way than, you know, I mean, in my opinion, than he had, but, but at the same time, I think it, it's very, it's very helpful for those of us who study um, child maltreatment and, and wanting to understand abuse. So it was an environment that set a child like Saul up for sexual assault because he needed that, you know, human connection with someone. And so when, when everybody is starving him, chopping his hair off, um, you know, ordering him around, putting children in cages, you know, but there's this one guy that's nice to him and says, oh, well, you can play hockey and, you know, we're going to give you some special privileges. So it set him up for that kind of abuse. And that pattern, we've seen that pattern happen with the, the Olympic gymnasts that were assaulted, you know, where they were treated so horrifically, they were victims of physical abuse, you know, and their basic needs were not valued. And that's what happens with these uh, Native American kids as well. And that, that's another timely thing is the, these mass graves that we're finding right now. I think at last count, there were over 7,000 children found in, found in um, graves with using the new sonar equipment that they have to investigate what. And so, yeah, it is timely that we're, we're reading this and learning about it. And yeah, Gene, I know, I know your heart and I know that this kind of thing is incredibly difficult and yeah when religion which is an institution that professes to be about caring and you know the word of jesus was so pure and good and 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 then for people to take that and use it to abuse and to take advantage and to exploit yeah. little innocent kids you know it's, it's very difficult to understand 
but I think also important to recognize. I think too, uh, you know, we have to learn how to move past, at least I do, trusting people because as you just brought up the gymnastic situation, my daughter actually went to the camp under the same, the Bella Caroli, yeah, when she was in high school and or she was like 14. And when that story came out, I, I mean, nothing happened to her, but it was horrifying. Like I trusted these people and, um, you know, you trust the church and even today the Catholic church, you know, and it's a, I'm not saying anything against it. And, um, cause I think you can find, you know, people in all religions that can misbehave, but there's been a lot of stuff lately, even in the news uh, about, and it just really gives, I don't know, it's just hard to, you know, to give trust to people. And so I'm working yeah. on that. <laughs> For sure. And, you know, that's part of our jobs as social workers to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and to make sure that, you know, I think just being aware of this helps everybody you don't have to be a social worker to be aware that this kind of thing you know that when there's institutions set up that that seem to not work right we need to be careful to be protecting the vulnerable people that might be a part of a of an institution that uh i don't know glorifies male dominance or something like that you know and so we, we need to be aware of the vulnerable individuals that could be victims. Yes. Absolutely. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, I've got um, Brooke. I don't know if you, if you wanna, if you, if you don't have your video on, but that's fine if you just wanna, if you wanna talk, that's great. Um, well, <laughs> um, I didn't read the book, but I did, uh, watch it on Netflix. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was pretty gruesome to watch. Like, I did not expect it to be that, like that. Like, I didn't, I didn't think about what it was like. When it, when the church um, when they brought in natives into church and I just believed like yeah everything's gonna be fine and it's church but then then I found out like the stories of how how the church cut their hair bathed them with white powder and made them made them talk in English instead of their native tongue and it was very it was very devastating to see the see that like belittling them you know like it was very heartbreaking to see that yeah. And um, Gina um, talked about how um, the, and even Laura said that um, the man was um, teaching the boys to play hockey. I felt like he was grooming the um, kids into believing that he is the only safe place for them to be. And it was very heart-wrenching to feel like these kids had nowhere else to go and you know, believing him into thinking this was right. This was normal. This was their way of life. That's the only way they can, it's the only way they can live to, or survive. Yeah. This is very sad. You know, Brooke, um, like, I, okay, I'm one of those people that I, I love movies, but I also love books. And I'm one of those people, whenever I see a movie that's made from a book, I mean, the book is always the bottom part of, of the iceberg and the movie is the very tip. <laughs> but I really felt like they did an excellent job in that movie of recreating the book and taking the most important points of the book 
and um, and focusing on them. Now, there's so much more of the story is in the book itself, but they made that movie after Richard Wagamese's after his death. So it was kind of a tribute to him. And he's written several other books that are so wonderful. Part of what I loved about this book is that I listened to it on, um, I listened to an audio book of it that is read by the author mm -hmm. and his voice, his, um, you know, his Native American kind of accent is so charming and that he's reading his own words. There's something just really powerful about that. There was one scene in the movie that I thought was was really powerful and that's at the end where where the um the father came to meet Saul when Saul had experienced a lot of success as a hockey player and you see Saul kind of you know um I am you see him kind of uh, not resentment but like freeze like like experience PTSD like yeah <laughs> like he kind of um cowers back you know and and he goes to hug him and everything and do you remember what the priest tells him he says something like what happened at the school was wrong and that's before you understand what really happened at the school right but, I'm just um, like sitting there like why is he so frightened of him he like he gave a, he uh, placed him in hockey he, he's um, basically his father figure and I'm yeah. just like, and then he, they show the scene where he's been sexually assaulted. I'm just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. That's what happened. Okay. That's yep. why he's so frightened. Yeah. <laughs> and in the book, it explains it much, much more in detail further. But, um, but it also explains his, his uh, dive down the rabbit hole of substance abuse. And I think a big part of the lesson of this book is better understanding um, substance abuse issues in, in people who have been victims of childhood trauma. I mean, you really have a better understanding of, you know, and this poor kid, I mean, he, he experienced this whole ethnic cleansing experience as a young child, but then it continued even in his success as a hockey player, you know, the, the, the white people in the crowds would call him names and, um, and then he moves on, he moves up in, in the hierarchy of hockey till he's at the top team and he's the only Native American on that team. And then he's even tortured by his teammates. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the fact that he turns to drugs and alcohol is not a big surprise, but the, one of my favorite things is how he overcomes. And that to me, that's the big lesson. You know, it's a, the, the focus on the, the um, recovery and, you know, that, that how he needs to talk about it in order to heal from it. And I think that's just so important. I think a lot of us have uh, trust past trauma that we haven't talked about yet, you know, and I know a lot of my students, you guys, you guys have started, you're writing about it, you know, you're getting to that point. Um, but that's such an important part of recovery is, is being able to talk. And I think that, you know, you can't help but wonder what Richard's personal experiences, we know that he's a part of this whole, you know, culture of people that were victims of this ethnic cleansing and forced assimilation, but um, you, can't, you can't help but wonder how many of his own experiences he put into this book. Yeah, for sure. Bobby, would you like to, um... Tell us what your um, thoughts on the book are. Hi, I'm Bobby. Um, I'm with Gina. I'm in social work and anthropology right now. So this book is really touching on all of the topics we've been reviewing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really nice to just um, have everything kind of come together. Mm -hmm. um, I too found a lot of just pain in the quote of kill the Indian, save the man. You know, it really brought to life how much our government was trying to kill a culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all heard about it, but to actually be learning about it in depth enough to know quotes and, 
you know, actual things that were slogans and said, you know, really opens your eyes. Um, the people that are in class with me probably know I have a somewhat negative history of a relationship with the Native American. So I've talked about it a lot in my social work class that I've always been kind of biased and my eyes were not open and everything we've been learning and along with this book really helped to just open my mind. And um, like Laura said, it really does just open your eyes to why there are substance abuse programs. You know, if we see a white person on the drunk on the street drunk, we instantly think, gosh, you know, I wonder what they've gone through. Mm -hmm. um, but when you see a native drunk, you automatically stereotype and, you know, this book, along with everything we've learned, has really helped me to not stereotype and just to be open to that generational trauma. You know, Bobby, um, some of the research that I did in connection with this book brought up, um, you know, interviews from Native Americans who are my age and older who survived the boarding schools. And, you know, Richard's Richard's um, explanation of what went on was mild by comparison to, mm -hmm. to some of the other things. Like um, there was one story of, uh, of the young girls, the young native girls who were sexually assaulted, who became pregnant and the, chill, the babies would be killed immediately mm -hmm. after birth, like by being thrown into a fire. So just, and this was by nuns who didn't believe in abortion, but felt like they needed to cover up what was going on. And, and what, how did they justify covering it up? They justified covering it up because they had been, you know, their interpretation of the Bible is that white people have more value than people of color. And mm -hmm. uh, that, and their interpretation of the events of history are that, oh, look at all of these people of color who, who died of disease when the white men came on, you know? And so that must mean that it's our job to take over. <laughs> and- That's and crazy. It, yeah. Um, taking their language from them. Um, cut, we've talked about cutting their hair. There was so much pride in their hair. So that was huge. That was huge and, to cut know, off someone's hair. Like even in college history classes, you don't learn in depth all of the horrible things that happened. You learn the general stuff like the making them speak English, cutting their hair, but even up to college history, you don't learn how horrible it really was until you start taking, you know, social sciences classes and, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's a reason that, that we, uh, we want you to have a well-rounded education. We want you to really understand you know, history from every, I mean, I, for, for me, I think a, um, a well-rounded education, you should come out of it with an attitude that people are people, that we are all individuals and that, you know, the, the janitor that takes the garbage out should be treated with the same amount of respect of, as the president of the college, you know, and, uh, you know, I think this book does a good job of that, of reminding us that we come from a history where people were stereotyped and literally put in cages because they were different. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Bobby. Thanks, Bobby. Um, Heather, would you like to comment? Yeah, um, first off, sorry for being late. I had one heck of a time. I actually texted you, Laura. I could not get on. <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry. Oh, so, yeah. So We're was, recording it so you can watch the first part that you missed later. Okay, okay. Um, I actually, I watched the movie on Netflix, and then I began reading the book as well. Um, you know, Professor Debenham is very right on there's a lot more details in the book than a movie I think that goes for any movie that we watch that is also a book there's a lot more details in the book um I was really intrigued when I started watching it the very beginning where you know the I believe it was his grandma you know his relatives sorry about the little one thank you 
where the relatives were trying to get him hidden from the white folk. You know, that was, it was empowering to watch that. Like they were already started off with trauma. I mean, they're already running from everything that they know. They're not able to just live. They're living in to, in the end result, he gets taken to just experience even more trauma. You know, your hair, your hair getting cut off the, the bathtub where, how they scrubbed them. That was just, that was just mortifying to be able to see that. And that's how you're going to treat, shh, quiet. You're going to treat, um, these children and not even look at them as though they're children. I mean, they were just looked at as different and to be punished for speaking their native tongue, like just all of it. It was a very, it was a very powerful video. Um, it definitely, definitely gave me an insight to the native culture. I actually, I was adopted at a young age. Um, and when I did find out about, you know, my birth father, I was just adopted by the father's side. And when I did find out about him, I found out I was native. So, you know, my grandma is, I believe she was um, full Cherokee and Chippewa. So she's like full blown native. Um, my grandpa wasn't, but she was. So just to hear that and to know like my own grandmother who's no longer here could have had like family members or could have experienced you know, a life like that, that's, it definitely gives you a different insight on things. And I think Bobby is right. We are so busy stereotyping people, um, you know, making assumptions, making judgment calls that the one thing, yeah, we need to focus on getting out of this class with education, like Professor Debenham had said, is to view people as people, you know, everybody is different. You know, Heather, did you notice is that the first part of the book where the the grandmother and the parents are are working to protect the two little boys and then uh -huh. one passes away um i noticed that and I, you probably did too that you know you see the the mom and dad um they had been a part of the boarding school they had been victims of it yep. and they had succumbed to the substance abuse issues as a result of that the grandmother seemed to acknowledge that and comprehend that did not blame them for being addicted knew the horrors that they had gone through and they had also a, a little girl had died right rachel had died and so she she just her heart went out to them but it didn't make her stop doing what she needed to do to protect her little grandson and I just and she loved. was powerful to die to like pass away, you know, to die in the way that she did yeah. was just it was so that part alone is like so powerful. Like she was gonna go to the ends of the earth to make sure that her grandson was okay. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, and it's, it's so sad. If you study Native American culture, there's there's less um sexism there seems to be you know they have like five genders as opposed to two you know <laughs> and they're they're just and one of the things i loved about richard's writing is you know he would talk about the women in his life with as much respect as the men and and his grandmother was a a big part of or that saul's grandmother was a big part of that which makes me wonder who richard's grandma was you know what that was like but I thought that was so beautiful and it's empowering. Just you try to like piece it together on, you know, and I think yeah. you're right. Like he definitely had to have went through some of his own experiences, the yeah. author himself. Yeah. Well, generational trauma. I mean, it, basically what that means is that if your family went through it, you're experiencing it. You know, it trickles down. And I know in your life personally, Heather, I know that you've had some pretty horrific experiences but you've also had that trickle down experience from your Cherokee Chippewa grandmother yeah that's why I forced myself to watch the movie right away <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie with my past it was a little it was a little difficult you know it there was some points in that movie where I was like okay can I finish watching this but you know this is something that we all signed up for no matter what our past entails and you know my passion shh is making a difference and you know helping others who need our help 
and, you know, being the voice for people when nobody was a voice for me. So I did force myself to watch it. Actually, my husband had to work the next morning. Shh, you are so okay. Wow. She she has a voice too, mommy. Right. Oh, I'm not his mom. I'm his auntie. This is my nephew, and he is he's something. You're Leo, yes. We know. So he anyways, he had to work in the morning and he actually ended up staying up until past midnight watching that movie. He got so like connected and focused that he actually ended up watching it with me wow that's good. It, it, it was a good it was a good movie and that's like really what pulls you in like I needed to know more there's just so much more in the book than there is in the movie yes okay Leo <laughs> you see you here? Come here. I love it oh and I hope we didn't lose Johnny I was going to call on him next because he had his hand up um but then we dropped Maybe he'll jump, join, jump back. In. Oh, hopefully. Um, he might have had to go, go, and that's why he had to put his hand up there. Um, great. Oh, hi, Leo. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're on TV. Um, great. Thanks, Heather, for that. Um, and uh, I'm, I hope I'm going to say your name right. Uh, La Hale, La Ela. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, and you did say it right. <laughs> I said it right? Oh, good. I um, I watched the movie and started to read the book. Um, I'm just a really slow reader. So after only doing like two chapters, I was like, you know, I'm going to just watch the movie and then read as I can. Um, but I I thought it was very interesting. And the scene that they talked about um when they show when he visits the father visits um him at the hockey rink um I thought that was a great scene because you don't see a lot of that like I agree when they when he went to hug him you could tell something was wrong even when he entered the scene like you saw his his reaction to him was very like something was wrong he didn't he felt uncomfortable he didn't want to him to be there um so I thought that was great and I don't have a lot of experience with the um Native American culture but I had a, a classmate from culinary school that he was a Native American and had gotten into a lot of trouble and um with substance abuse and just vandalizing and just doing criminal activities and now I can understand like well he probably had a really traumatizing background and that's why he would have he would gone to those things and I just thought it was amazing like it brought me back to him and his like when we would talk and everything and it was interesting and very eye-opening of what they really did go through because I had no idea of of the past that they had I knew it was a hard um thing to live through kind of had like a slight background of it but not as much detail as Richard had gone into and when I started reading the book like I could tell like there was less detail because in the beginning it talks about when they're hiding away from the white folks and that's when the book describes the parents alcoholism where you don't really see that in the movie um, so that was interesting of after seeing the movie, now I'm reading this like, oh, that they actually had alcoholism. That's why he was an alcohol when he's going through his story in the movie. And that was just incredible. And sad to see that he never saw his parents again. Like, and after losing his brother and then losing his parents, I know that feeling emotionally, like I've been away from my parents I was taken away as a child mm -hmm. and not being able to see them I was able to see them every once in a while but and then being emotionally abused by my caretakers like I I felt uh connected to that um of what he had gone through 
And then I thought it was insane. Like in the movie, they show when he's getting bathed and that rock that his brother had told him to keep. I thought that was really messed up where he couldn't even have a rock. Like something that was brought to his past, but they didn't know what that rock was. But he was not allowed to keep them. That was the last thing from his brother. Um, so I think that was really messed up. But just the seeing of what the church was like was very hard to watch. Yeah. And then you know, he was raped and sexually abused and stuff like that. Like that blew me away. Like I could not believe that that had happened. Because you see, he was just trying to be nice, but now when you guys were talking about he was grooming him to be vulnerable to that situation but yeah the movie actually kind of tiptoed around that the book um you know that book and some of his other books that he's written you come to recognize that probably uh, the majority of the children in those schools were raped that was just a means of control that that happened. And what I think is interesting is if you think about it, someone who goes through that kind of trauma, normal, a normal response would be to lash out, right? I mean, that would be normal. A normal response would be to do to do something to try to repress those memories like substance abuse <laughs> issues. So um Lahela, did you notice in that in that scene with the father when he comes to to meet him when he's playing hockey, when Saul's playing hockey. One of the things the father says is he's been transferred to Africa. Did you catch that? Yeah. You wonder why he's been transferred to Africa? You know, I mean, I think, I think it's really interesting to watch the movie. For those of you who haven't read the book yet, watch the movie, read the book, and go back and watch the movie. <laughs> and you're going to go, oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so much. You know, what's interesting in, in some of my research, I, come, I came across the fact that the Indian Civil Rights Act was passed in 1968. Um, so, so Indian Horse was set in Canada, um, I believe after that the Indian rights, the Indian Civil Rights Act was passed. So um, our Canadian neighbors were a little bit behind us at the same time, there were horrific things that went on in both countries. And, you know, that part of fighting back, that Native American spirit of fighting back is the reason the Indian Civil Rights Act was passed. And there's a lot of beautiful, good, positive stories that go along with that as well, and as, as well as these dark, horrific, sorrowful stories. Yeah, and I just want to just jump in. Um, um, when you were talking, Heather mentioned it, a couple of people mentioned it about how, how come we didn't learn about this? You know, how, how come, how come when we learn about Native American, um, the very little that we do learn about like Native American culture and history when we're in school, um, this isn't really talked about, um, you know, all the different aspects of the suffering and the trauma that gets, um, that gets passed down. Um, and I think um, for me, that's the beauty of, of a novel um, is to be able to access this kind of content um, and then want to know want to know more about it. Um, um, you know, the ability to access empathy through a, through story um, because it's so personal. Um, I think that's the strength of this book um, is that there's so much horrific content that if you were to hear it like as a news story, you would just kind of shut it out, like um, turning the TV off, I can't handle it, there's too much. Um, but when you read it in a, in a setting like this, it's, not, it's no less horrific, but because of the storytelling aspect of it, um, I think for me anyway, I'm able to open up and, and feel that empathy. Um, and so it does give me hope that, um, um, that we can access that empathy that will break down those stereotypes um, through this sort of representation. So, I had one thing to say on, um, you guys have all brought up the part where towards the end of the movie, where, you know, one of the priests comes, in, that priest, the one that groomed him, 
comes in at the end at one of his hockey games and his initial reaction is just like horror, like it's fear. Um, I think that a big part for that with me, and I mean, I live with PTSD every day is that was a trigger. So I think that this, like looking at it as a whole, like that was a trigger for him, like a big trigger for him. And I think that it really contributed, you know, even more to his addiction, um, you know, to have to relive that again, um, and it just made me think about my own triggers that I go through. I think that part was really, really significant, like to see the reaction. Yeah, Ashley, I saw that you had your hand up. Did, did yeah, you... can I think I'm froze. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting the way that those dark parts of the story were they were kind of held off. I mean, they told the story or he told the story of him growing up and it was like kind of this victory story of how he came from adversity and, and put his mind in the right place and got through it. And, and there was the brief mention of what was happening to the other kids, like the slaps of the skin and the noises. And it was almost like he was outside of that. Mm -hmm. And so they told the story as he was outside of that, like he wasn't really put through that because he was in, in the, in the midst of everything in his mind in hockey and so uh, you know I didn't necessarily think that he was being put through that and then the way that they introduced it in the end and brought it full circle of he was in the middle of that and it was someone that was very that was made to be a hero in the story to begin with it was actually the one that was that had put him through that and so it was very interesting to think that the story is something that you know he was he didn't go through that and then after all the drinking and stuff and it's so true in life, how we get to know people, you know, if I meet someone, we talk about good things and we talk about surface things. And then as you get to know someone or be in a relationship with someone, whether it's family or friends, you get to know their deep, darker parts and, and what makes them, you know, their pain that they've gone through. Cause everyone, it's part of the human experience to go through pain. And so it was very interesting the way that he told that story and the way that he kind of saved that part of it. Like he gave us bits and pieces of that's kind of what was going on. So we kind of like it made you wince and think, oh gosh, you know, that's not something like you said, the news story, you would shut it off if it was just like full bore right away, but just sprinkling it throughout the story and then being like, yes, he actually went through all of that as well with that person. So it was just really powerful. Yeah, Gina. I think one thing that I really thought about, because we're studying, we study this all the time in social work is, and currently about privilege. Mm -hmm. And you know, I started thinking, you know, the privilege that we have just to have a voice and to have a say in what goes on in our life. And I remember thinking, you know, like through the whole process of, you know, Indian horse was that, I mean, I have six grandkids and the even thought of them having to be taken away. Um, I picked them up one day and my youngest granddaughter told me that she didn't get to go to recess because she didn't eat all of her lunch. And I was like, what? So I told her parents and her dad wrote this huge long letter to the person in charge of lunch program at school. And so we were her voice and it didn't happen again. And, and, you know, and she does go to a Catholic school. And so I was watching this. I'm like, are they a little too strict there? You know, cause we're just so protective and these kids, I mean, even as their grandparents, you know, knowing where they were going, you know, I, it's just heart wrenching. I can't imagine not being able to protect my grandchildren or my own children. And we live in, to me, that's a privilege that they didn't have. Yeah. And I think that's also a, a symptom of generational trauma and that it happens in a lot of families, not just native Americans where, where there's, um, you know, generational trauma, abuse handed down through the families. You guys have been writing about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, sexism sometimes where one gender isn't allowed to protect children the way the other one is or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to share with you guys, uh, first of all, I want Leo to know, hey, Leo. Hey, Leo. Hi, buddy. You're an <laughs> important person. Yes, you are. Hi. 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 Okay. You feel better? Good. That's how I communicate with my grandkids live long distance. Does he feel better? Is it all better? 
Still okay. Okay. okay, good, good, good. Okay, I wanted to tell you guys, Johnny had to go because he's in the process today of getting his QMHA, his Qualified Mental Health Associate cert Certification. <laughs> he's in the training right now. So he was trying to juggle everything. And he wanted me to tell you guys, uh, he said, I'm sorry, I watched the movie and I hated it and loved it at the same time. And I know, I know John wouldn't mind me sharing with you guys, you know, he's been, he's been victim of his fair share of trauma and is now turning around um, other, other people's lives and working very directly with substance abuse clients and uh, is just having an incredible impact. And so, you know, I can understand. I loved and hated the movie too. Mm -hmm. It was empowering. It was heart wrenching, and and the book even more so. Mm -hmm. The book, I, I loved it even with more passion, and I hated it with more passion because mm -hmm. you know I don't I don't want to be the part I I don't want to be a part of any system that allows that kind of thing. And I feel like, you know, a big step toward having a voice to stand up against that is things like this, making sure that others are educated and are aware of our history, of our real history. Mm -hmm. um, I, one thing I kind of, you know, I pulled other things when I was, you know, even watching the movie into it, like even today with the pandemic, a lot of us are feeling government force, you know, whether you know, we want to assimilate into, okay, you have to get a vaccine, you know, and I'm not on the side of either, you know, I'm just making general statements, but I know a lot of people that feel like the government's getting too involved in their life and they're not happy about it. Um, I, in a half an hour, have to get a measles shot because UNR is requiring it and I'm not real happy. About it. <laughs> but, you know, we want to have like autonomy of our, our, you know, our own person and they just did not have any you know almost in reference to like slavery you know they were just taken in and abused and it's it's embarrassing uh from for me just having you know privilege and being a catholic member i i've just been horrified and just embarrassed of all of what these people have encountered Um, what, what's super interesting, like to play on that with what I talked about earlier with the lithium mine and, and where in the book, it says, you know, you're, you can be raped physically, but also in many other ways of like your rights being taken away. And so the people up North that are, you know, their sacred land is being going to be used and torn up to mine lithium and which serves a whole nother purpose. So there's two different sides of it, but it's similar, you know, that's one of their last frontiers of the place that they have control over the place that is their home. And so to see, you know, the big businesses and the big money and the machines coming in to do that, it's like, there's so many movies that are kind of that same plot. And it's, it's easy to, especially after reading this book to understand why they're fighting back against that, even though there's, you know, it's for a purpose and it's not just for the destruction and it's not, we like to think that our society has evolved in so many ways, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's also goes back to that same power struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Ashley, when you said that, the thing that popped into my mind was um, Malagro Beanfield War. Did you see that? Um, uh, that's a really good one. We should read that book too. <laughs> they made a movie out of, but it's, it's, um, it's about, uh, farmers fighting for the land that wants to be taken over by oil fields and things, but uh, yeah. Yeah, Kirsten. So one thing, I mean, watching this, uh, well, I also watched the movie and um, the, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Well, okay. I've also been reading a book called Humankind and the author picks apart like how do things like this happen you know how do we end up with all these adults who um do these horrific things and nobody's stopping it um and so I mean he picks apart research and like from like the Stanford experience experiment and you know how things ended up getting going so far like with the holocaust and um all these like situations throughout history and so this is just another one of of those things that like how, do, how did we end up where like so many people 
you know, were interested in and willing to do all of these things that ended up in the uh, abuse and mistreatment of all these children. Um, so, I mean, that to me is part of the really, you know, fascinating part of like, how can we, you know, we research that and then prevent that obviously from happening again. Well, and, and how do we rise above? I mean, it's interesting just, I mean, looking at Wikipedia right now about Richard Wagamese or Wagamese, uh, he, he was married and divorced three times. He was, um, he was raised in foster homes before he was adopted at age nine by a Presbyterian family. And then he was the only white kid in his school and he said, you know, he was, he was taught to deny his own heritage mm -hmm. from a young age. He's estranged from one of his sons, you know, so he didn't lead a perfect life, but he, he disciplined himself enough to write and to, you know, he took this, this uh, white education and used it to speak, to tell the story of his culture, which, I mean, I think that, that, might be a good way to to focus you know coming out of something like reading this book <laughs> you know where do we go from from here you know rather than focusing on all the dark and you know i mean it's fascinating kirsten and i'm right with you studying why people do what they do why they're allowed to i'm i'm reading another book right now called dope sick and there's a um on hulu there's a eight-part series about the um the big pharma that pushed oxycodone and basically has caused millions of deaths in our country. And it's kind of the drawn out story of that. And it's based on this book, Dope Sick. And it's just the same story again of how people are exploited for money or for power or for whatever reason. And it's interesting how, you know, at the end people stand up and fight, you know, and they stand up and say, and there's, you know, a few people that rise above like Richard and make a statement and make a difference in their little circle. His circle before his death in 2017 at age 61, his circle had grown and I think it's grown since his death. There's even more people that know his name and, and more than that, you know, more importantly than his name is his message mm -hmm. of, of what happened in the Native American schools and what happened to his culture and that it, and that it wasn't right. I don't know, end of lecture. <laughs> um, so Brooke asks, has anyone heard of the German experiment? Um, do you wanna talk about that, Brooke, or you? Um, it, um, Laura talked about how, um, and um, one other one, sorry. I, I didn't That's okay. The name, but, um, they talked about how um, how could um, people have um, stood back while someone was um, being abused or hurt or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's funny because when I was in high school, I did a documentary on a German experiment. I didn't know what it was called or anything like that. I can't remember, even though like high school was like four months ago, but it, it was about an experiment that they did that they tested how, uh, how humans could evolve with, um, with being treated inhumane. Like they would be locked in cages for hours on end. They would have no sleep, no food, no water. And if they were behaving, it was like a prison to them. Like there were um, prisoners, quotations around prisoners of um, these people, like they signed up for this too. It was, it was really hard to watch the documentary, but um, the, these people signed up for it and they were prison, um, they were testing out if um, in history that they had prisoners and they would have um, jailers, that's the word, jailers that would abuse them and whip them if they did anything wrong. They would whip them with, um, I think, chains 
And if they did anything wrong, they would keep them in confinement and um, um, cages that were tiny for like children instead of men or women or stuff like that. And it was very, very hard to watch it as it was, it was actually an experiment on who could survive the most, who could, who could deal with that mentally and physically. And um, they had actually had to stop the experiment because um, I think one of the prisoners actually killed one of the jailers. Oh. It was very, very hard on their minds and their brains. They were having a delusion. They were having, um, um, I think they were having um, a hard time speaking clearly. Like they were, they were just out of their minds. And so they actually um, stopped the experiment. And the person that, um, the person that actually started the experiment actually um, went into more depth with the experiment, experiment, um, <laughs> uh, whatever it is, um, went in depth with it more and actually did a secret experiment. And he actually killed, I think, 10 people with it. And it, it was just mind blowing. It, it was very, very hard. Uh, Kirsten, did you have, did you want to? Yeah, so uh, uh, um, if you're fascinated in that kind of stuff, the theory of the author of Humankind does pick apart a lot of that kind of stuff, but I think I get what you're saying, Laura, um, about how that's kind of like um, looking at things, what I mentioned and uh, what Brooke was talking about is looking at things from like the psychology perspective, which is different than um, looking at it from a social work perspective. And I can appreciate, you know, that like um, maybe not going at it from that direction, but focusing on the experience of, you know, um, the Native Americans and in this specific situation and not really like why it happened to them, but um, how it's affected their lives and their, their future generations. And how we can help it not happen again. <laughs> Yeah. I lived in Alaska for, for quite a while and it was interesting up there. They have a very um, nuanced perspective in, and it, it runs over into um, the political realm and there's just, the native Alaskans have a whole lot more personal power. They have, um, you know, and, and part of it might be is that uh, it was later when their people were discovered it, then, you know, so maybe they weren't as um, that the whole forced assimilation, the ethnic cleansing wasn't quite as pronounced in the 1890s as it was in, say, the 1830s and 40s. So um, anyway, it, I, I've met a lot of wonderful Native Alaskans that that still might struggle with substance abuse issues and that kind of thing, but they're, they seem to be more empowered as a people they haven't had, they've still had generational trauma, but it hasn't been as pronounced. And um, one of the things that I loved about my further research about this issue is that in some ways, the boarding schools bonded Native Americans with each other. Like, you know, before boarding schools, there were thousands of tribes. There were thousands of different languages. But when, when, these, when Native Americans were put in boarding schools, they bonded together, they bonded with each other and um, the survivors to rise above had a new connection with each other that they didn't have beforehand. And I'm, my hope is that maybe the, the more, not advanced, but um, the more nuanced tribes like the Native Alaskans can, can um, be an empowering influence on some of the tribal cultures in the lower 48 that don't feel as empowered as, as groups of people. And you've, you've already seen that happening a little bit. We've seen that like in movies. Um, there's, there's a couple of famous, I can't think of their names, but famous Native American 
actors who are actually native Alaskans and they, they kind of, I don't know, kind of exude a sense of, of power and uh, personal power that's very cool and hopefully empowering to um, their brothers and sisters from other tribal cultures. And I mean, it all comes down to we're all tribal cultures, right? I mean, I hope in your anthropology classes, you guys are learning that more than anything, human beings are tribal. <laughs> we need each other. Hence, we have things like book clubs where we can hang out, be a tribe. Woohoo! Thanks, Dina. Dina has to run off. Um, yeah, I have to get my shot. <laughs> so oh, it, it'll be fine. It'll, you'll be fine and um, take some ibuprofen afterward. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. It was a good discussion. Great, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so just I just wanted to jump in on um, part of what we're talking about is um, is how cultures dehumanize um, one another, and I think um, you know kind of like what Gina was saying is I can't imagine this happening to my grandchildren. Um, I think for me, um, the more that the more um, reading that I, the anti-racist reading that I do, the, the more this realization is, is that what is it about our Anglo, Western Anglo um, culture that we will tolerate these things happening to African Americans or Native Americans, but when somebody, you know, when the same thing would be happening to a white child, all of a sudden we're horrified. And we, it's not even a conscious thing. I think we're just so, used to um, accepting that these things happened to other other people you know they don't happen to us um, and so I think that to me is is um, where personally I feel like a lot of the work needs to be done it's understanding that it, it happened to a person I didn't and and end it there not that it happened to a native person or african-american person I think Heather has a comment. Yeah, Heather. Yeah, hopefully Leo doesn't scream. Um, <laughs> so when I was watching this and I like how um, Gina actually mentioned before she um, had to go about she's Catholic too, you know, and it was really, it, it twisted her stomach and it did mine. I mean, I wear a St. Christopher every single day. I was, you know, baptized. I went to catechism. Baptized baptized yes I don't really I don't really uh practice anymore you know or go to church but it was very it made my stomach turn you know to know that to know that that's a religion I've been a part of since I was a kid and then the trauma I went through as a kid to like put those two together like it was a lot to wrap my brain around and I know that Professor Devin Devinham knows my um I guess passion or how intrigued I am in helping uh, polygamy. And I kind of related the same thing. Like I looked at it as like, we know, and we are, you know, we're all different cultures. Yes. But we're all tribal people. Yeah. And in polygamy as well, they're very dehumanized. Like if they don't, especially, you know, like the women, the men, all of them, like men will be turned away if they even try to think for themselves the women will be turned away or worse if they try to think for themselves or to pull away from the religion. So I don't know this, the whole, the book, the movie, everything, I'm not through the book yet completely, but I'm pretty intrigued. Like it was, it was definitely a piece of work that I'm glad I watched and I glad I, I'm glad I read. And I hope that goes for everybody else because I mean, as hard as it was to watch the movie, as hard as it is to read some of those details in the book. Um, I mean, it's what we're all passionate about, right? Is, you know, helping to end situations like these, helping to stop situations like these, prevent situations like these, and help those who have went through the situations to find, you know, their happy place again, to find healing. And I don't know, it was, it made me connect a lot between like the Catholic church and polygamy and to know, oh my gosh, I was a part of a religion that did that. Wait, what? So yeah, that was, and I've heard stories about the Catholic church. I think everybody has, you know, along the lines of a lot of stuff going on there, but to see it 
to have a piece of history like in your own hands that was that was big that was really yeah, big and, and i think that you know one of the things that's important to recognize i mean i've known people who are part of the flds community mm -hmm. that you know um people who practice plural marriage and um and i've known a lot of catholics and the majority of people seem to be really good people especially when they're connected with you know a strong sense of religiosity for the most part they're good but then there comes in these people who take advantage of those systems that that almost set people up for abuse you know um, did you ever see the movie escape polygamy i read the book and i think i saw the movie there, so there, that there's, one there's, there's a, a really good escape. point on that yeah yeah and there's a, there's a lot of organizations that do that maybe even unintentionally you know mm -hmm. they they set up a system where um where where a, one group of people are valued more than another group of people and the vulnerable people end up being victims of that group and so you know the rest of us have to do everything in our power to be a voice for those vulnerable little leos in the world right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh yeah i think that's i think that's my number one take home no i i agree i totally agree with you the end of that the reason i said that that movie specifically and if anybody hasn't seen it it's worth the watch if you don't want to read the book i mean it's worth the watch for sure um i found it on i think on plato's or something like that yeah but um that that point is made at the end of the movie that there, yeah, I mean, there was genuine people that lived there. Sure. They just believed differently, you know? Ashley, yeah. I see you have your hand up. Yeah, um, big full circle on the story. It was so interesting how, you know, he grew up in the trauma that he grew up in and hockey was kind of his outlet. And then he couldn't find himself in that because he was never, he never felt like he belonged with the people because he was always treated the way that he's always been and then going back to his hometown where he or where he was brought to after the school and didn't feel right there. And it was interesting. I mean, he was drinking to try to escape the, the trauma and then for him to leave and just run away because that's all he was, he was used to running away and turning inward and running. And it was interesting to how he had to go back to the Lake of the Gods and go back to the school and reconcile all those things that had happened and then come back to his adopted parents, I guess I would call them, and, and talk to them about what they went through before he was able to finally find some sort of peace within what had happened and move forward with his own development of himself and be able to give back to those, want to give back to those kids. But find it so, I mean, I think there's a part of that in all of us that, you know, we've all gone through a certain amount of things that are painful and hurtful. And a lot of people never get to that point where they've reconciled it and they're able to move past it. I mean, a lot of people die alcoholics and they never find their way out of that deep, dark cycle of chaos that comes from trauma. And, you know, like you said, the work that social work does is trying to, I mean, he was able to luckily do it for himself, find his own journey in a roundabout way. He never had a plan. He never knew where he was going. He just was able to intuitively let, you know, the universe guide him or whatever. Um, but in, in social work, I mean, you all see how that can be sped up in so many ways with intention of, you know, doing that work, but we all can relate to healing wounds and trauma that we will live with forever. Yeah. You know, Richard wrote several books of poetry before he wrote this novel and, when you read his poetry, you can see him working through these dark issues. And uh, I don't know, I, I would love to talk to, um, well, like Ashley, I really appreciate your insights here because you're a journalist, you know? And I think people with that writing background, there's something special about this book mm -hmm. in the way it's written. It's written in kind of a journalistic way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, the way that it tells a story. And yeah. what, like when you talk about poetry and writing, I had an uncle and he passed away last year. He was an alcoholic and music was his only outlet. Mm -hmm. And I have a box of his poems that he wrote because he was a writer, but he never got out of his own 
way enough to do anything with his life. So yeah, it's very important to be able to help people. And, and he didn't want help. He didn't want yeah. out of, cause he didn't see people as good. He didn't see people as helpful. He didn't see society as something that he wanted to be a part of. And he's not native American, but he's just one of those deep, dark, creative people. And a lot of people in my family are and then don't get out of that cycle and it's it's heartbreaking because life can be so beautiful but if you can't see past that trauma and you get locked in those deep dark places it's so hard to get out but ashley you know you're describing emily dickinson Mm -hmm. when you talk about your uncle you know she never shared anything it wasn't until after her death that her sister discovered her desk full of poetry you're describing you know you're describing emily dickinson And I think there's a lot of people out there that might not, you know, they might not be on the forefront. They don't have a podcast or (laughs) a TikTok channel, (laughs) but they're, but they're, you know, in their own quiet way, adding to the creativity in the world. And, you know, Richard Wagamese and another one, another author I absolutely love is Frank McCourt. If you've read Angela's Ashes or Mm -hmm. any of his other books. And he talks about poverty and the Catholic church as well and how how damaging those institutions were to him. But he also rose above it. A lot of the reasons that these people rise above it is because there's one other person in their life that has their back, you know, that wants to hear their poetry, that, that connects with them in that real meaningful way. And I'm sure you did that, Ashley, with your uncle. Sounds like you really loved him. I tried, I tried last year to help him out of the darkness. Yeah. And you, know, you can only do so much for someone that, you know, doesn't necessarily want out of that. And that's all they know. And it's heartbreaking, yeah. but it, you know, they have so many gifts and I can really, I mean, I'm a journalistic writer, but I've always had journaling has always been my outlet and I've always done lettering and art, but I've never shared anything publicly. And so I can relate to that, you know, that, deep creative urge, but then not being able to figure out a way to be helpful to other people in that way yet and and being on that mission. But from what I've learned from my family and their journeys, like being able to know like what not to do and to try to move past that, not only for myself, but for them. That's beautiful. And I, I started out telling you guys a little bit about myself and my work in the Montana women's prison with a lot of Crow Native women. And one of the stories, I th- I've probably told my students this, they've probably heard it, but I'll tell it again. <laughs> so uh, one woman that I worked with had been in a boarding school and she and her brother, her brother had passed away. They'd both been raped. They both had horrific things happen to them in their boarding school. And so I challenged her. She'd never written a word in her life, really. And I I brought in, gave her a notebook and a pen. And I said, I want you to write your story down. And she started writing. And I worked in that prison for a few years. When I left the prison system, there, there were inmates that had asked this person to write their story down too. And when I left, her notebook was bulging and she had started on several other notebooks, you know? And uh, those stories, who knows if they've ever been published or ever will be published, Mm -hmm. but they were empowering for those people in that setting. You know what I mean? And I think that's what's beautiful. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think that's what's beautiful about this book is that he took a conglomerate. He took a lot of people's stories and created Mm -hmm. one story that touches us and makes us want to know more. And so, you know, I Googled Native American boarding schools and you get testimony asked after testimony of individual stories of people who have survived. And I mean, right now in a pandemic, we're all freaking surviving, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're all kind of in this survival mode. But Um, it's caused us to totally rethink our lives and, and create intention around what we're really doing and why we're here and what, you know, what's important. And that's huge. Yeah. I would, I can't wait to read your book, Ashley. Yeah. (laughs) I know Heather's working on one. Heather needs to write a book. I think all of you guys probably have a book in you. Yeah. I started it. I started it. So you you encouraged me. So I'm taking I'm taking the leap. Good. You have a great story. Yeah, and I just as an artist, um, 
I, you know, the power of the arts to heal, I could go on and on, you know, I, I would be, you know, pre I'd be preaching at y'all, but, um, and, and that was one of the things when, um, when that Saul says is they wanted me to talk, you know, when he goes to the, um, and I, and he doesn't want to talk, you know, in a lot of cultures, especially men don't, you don't talk about your feelings, but to be able to write it, um, and put it in, in written form. Um, same is true for visual arts, dance, music, anything. Um, I think to me, um, that is something that, that is the beauty of, like I said before, about having something in a novel form is that um, people will access it in that way that wouldn't access it in any other way. Um, so I think it's, it's a yeah. thing. And, and movie too. And the movie too, absolutely. There's people. Yeah. People will watch the movie who won't read the book. Exactly. But then they'll they may read the book after they've watched the movie. Yeah, exactly. Right. And some people, you know, like the audio is, you know, whatever, whatever um, form you want to take that content in, you know, I, I think that's the important thing, right? Is just to get the content in and have that experience of empathy um, and see how it opens you up. And helping people understand how powerful it can be for other people like a lot of people like Saul you know probably think I'm broken I don't matter because that's all that had been programmed into him his whole life and then to have this you know heartbreakingly beautiful story come out of it with so much value for not only himself but people who read it and can see you know maybe you don't like hockey and maybe you weren't raped as a child but the the pain and the outlet and I mean there's so many facets of that that we all can relate to certain parts of our life and see within ourselves and it's healing to share stories absolutely that's beautifully said why we have a book club right gail that's right that's why we have a book club which is a wonderful segue um we're about ready to i'm gonna hit this in the um in the chat there our next book is a science fiction one we've never we haven't done science fiction yet um so it'll be completely different it's called the city we became by nk Jem, um, jeminson she's an african-american um, science fiction writer um and she's won all sorts of awards um and uh, Josh, Dr. Josh Webster, who's um, uh, one of our English professors here at GBC, he's down, down in Prump. He's going to be facilitating that conversation. He recommended that book. So um, he's so, got a brilliant mind too. I love his brain. Josh and is his, great, and he—it's yeah. um, really fun to get him on a tangent talking about a book because he really examines it from all sorts of different um, sides. And and I have to say, um, I'm not a—I mean, I, I there's certain science fiction that I really enjoy. Um, but the more that I read it, the more that I feel like science fiction does a really good job of delving into to diversity um, and, and these issues that we're, that we're facing in a way that maybe will override, can kind of jump over people's resistance. Like somehow maybe somebody will feel like, um, like Gina was saying, maybe you feel a little defensive if somebody, or guilty, if somebody's like, you feel like you're always being accused of being the bad white person. But if you're talking about aliens from another planet, maybe you, maybe it overrides that and you can kind of develop a sense of, um, of how, how to stop othering, um, you know, maybe it comes up that way. So I think, I think there's a lot of potential with, um, with science fiction. For sure. And I think a lot of um, I, my students probably have heard me say this, but um, science fiction is often connected with autism spectrum disorder. <laughs> and so we have, yeah. um, you know, we have a lot of the times when we want to better understand people on the spectrum, we can do that through science fiction. We can see how uh, how their brains work in a in a different and a nuanced way, um, not defective, but different. Yeah. A different way of seeing the world. Definitely, it's empowering. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Laura. Does anybody before we we sign off? Does anybody have anything they want to add? Last thing they want to add. Thank you for an amazing discussion. Oh, thanks for joining us, Ashley. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry that um, Johnny wasn't able to stay on, and um, but um, we hope that you will join us for future books. And we will. Um, and uh, Laura is going to continue suggesting some wonderful ones, so that we'll. Um, and I'm sure she'll um, she'll encourage you all to participate. But um, I did have I put in the link. Um, uh, the Humanity Center webpage, and that's got all um, all the information. So. Thanks, Gail. All right, thanks everyone. Have a wonderful weekend, and have a lovely Thanksgiving.
You too. Okay. Bye, everybody. Stay healthy. You too.